Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to the sixth webinar of the year 2018, being organized by the Teaching Association on reducing artifacts while recording cortical potentials by Dr. C. S. Panaja. I welcome you all for this. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to uh, give a few pointers as to how to ask questions after the webinar is completed. As you can see on the panel on the right side, there are two uh, marks, the question mark and a hand raising symbol. You can click on either of them and then the mic will be unmuted and you can ask the question yourself or you can click on the question mark panel and then you can type out the question which will be read out later. Now, I request Professor Asha Yatiraj, President Isha, to welcome the guest and start the webinar. Thank you, Achaya. Welcome all once again to this sixth Isha webinar. Um, we have with us Dr. C.S. Vanaja, who's going to talk to us about reduction of artifacts while recording cortical potentials. Um, Vanaja has done all of her education at the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, Mysore. That's her bachelor's, master's, and PhD. She did her PhD under the guidance of Professor um, Dr. Nikam. She worked at Aish for many years and due to personal reasons had to shift to Pune uh, to Bharati Vidya Peet uh, Deemed University in the year 2007. Her name has always been synonymous with uh, electrophysiological measurements and um, we're really, really happy to have somebody with so much of knowledge who's going to be addressing us. She has received a WHO fellowship in, uh, at uh, St. Louis, USA, and trained for electrophysiological testing at the Central Institute for the Deaf. She has received uh, several, several uh, awards at the national conferences and then that's for the best papers. She's also the recipient of the prestigious Padma Shri Professor S. Kameshwaran Oration Endowment in the year 2012. She has served in different capacities for Isha, the main being the editor of the Journal of Indian Speech and Hearing Association and also as a guest uh, editor of the association. She has been the president of Misha, that is the Maharashtra branch of Isha. Um, she has, I think, close to 30 years or, of experience in the field and has over 50 publications in national and international journals and more, uh, almost equal number in national and equal number in international journals. She, the articles that she's published in the international journals are those highly reputed ones and not one of those paid journals that we see a lot of people using. Um, her clinical experience has been majorly with diagnostic uh, audiology and uh, I have had this great opportunity to do research work along with uh, Vanaja. So it has been a great pleasure working with her and somebody with an immense amount of knowledge. Uh, before I invite Dr. Vanaja to start talking, I would like to tell you about our continued effort to get RCI CRE points for the participants. We are at it continuously. We did get one reply from them giving us uh, information about the CRE points. We wanted more information from them about it, so we have replied back to them. And I just talked to Dr. Ashok Sinha, who's in charge about it, and he tells me that tomorrow there will be a meeting again about it and they will finalize maybe within a week. So I do hope we have positive news about the RCI CRE points. So I now welcome Dr. Vanaja to talk. She will be talking for about an hour. And after the hour, you can ask your questions. And like uh, Achaya just told you, um, you can either use the hand symbol or you can type in your questions over there. I hope Achaya will still be online. He's in a flood area. And uh, so it's he's having a lot of problems with the internet. So if he's not able to do it, I will continue the uh, 
the webinar asking the questions and everything else. So we have 38 people who have registered for this program today and are currently 23 of them have uh, gone online. So Vanaja, I welcome you. Thank you, Asha, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. I hope I do justice to what Isha members are expecting. At the outset, I thank Isha for organizing this webinar and giving me an opportunity to share my experience. So, to start off, the overview of the webinar is going to be this way. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about cortical work potentials, what is it, and then the clinical applications of it, then how do we record it, and to talk about artifacts, we should know a little bit about the instrumentation, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. So I'm going to revise the instrumentation, how the instrumentation reduces noises or artifacts. And then what are the major sources of artifacts and how, what can we do when we encounter artifacts? So some of this may be very introductory to some people. I hope you'll get with me for the introductory part of it. And my major aim is to see how cortical evoke potentials can be used in clinics. That is, in routine clinics, how do we use it? Because we all know that cortical evoke potential has great applications in research. And I'm not going to focus on the research part of it because we do record cortical evoke potential using multi-channel equipment, 1064 channel or 128 channel or 256 channel. First of all, I do not really have experience using the NeuroScan. And my, all of my experience is using clinical equipment. And that is what I'm trying to see how best people can use it in everyday clinics. So all of you are familiar with auditory work potentials and it can be classified based on the latencies into early, middle and late potentials. So we all know that Cortical evoke potentials were first recorded by Davis in 1939, and it represents the activation in thalamocortical segment. And even though it was recorded, it was the first potential to be recorded, somehow I feel this is not really being used that much. The other potentials like the ABR took over the cortical evoke potentials. Uh, Cortical evoke potentials can be broadly, I've divided them into, I mean, there are different ways of classifying these evoke potentials. I've divided them here into obligatory responses and event-related potentials. And again, all of you know that obligatory responses are responses that occur when we just hear a sound. That is, cortical evoke potentials that are in response to an acoustical signal is obligatory responses. Event related is when a meaning is attached to it or when an event occurs because of that. And again, my presentation is going to focus on the obligatory responses, but whatever we discuss can also be applied to event related potentials. So in the obligatory cortical evoke potentials, we know that we basically get four peaks, two positive and two negative peaks in the latency of 50 to 300 milliseconds or 60 to 300 milliseconds. So the first positive peak occurs at around 60 milliseconds, N1 occurs at around 100 milliseconds, P2 around 160 milliseconds, and N2 occurs around 200 milliseconds. Now these cortical yoke potentials have made up, can be applied in herding assessment or in rehabilitation. So when we think in terms of hearing assessment, the applications include the threshold estimation, but this is really cortical yoke potentials are not really the choice of test for threshold estimation for the obvious reason that they're affected by sleep. And most often we test babies for sleeping. So ABR is a choice of test for threshold estimation. But if, if you are assessing hearing in a person who is awake and alert, then CAPs actually give more information than auditory brainstem response. And the other application is in assessing the severity of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, or it can also be used for assessing central auditory processing. In terms of oral rehabilitation, the main applications I normally talk of is one is verification of hearing devices, saying whether a hearing aid or a cochlear implant is 
benefiting a child or it's not it's useful for a child or not useful for a child and monitoring plasticity and it is also being used in predicting speech understanding or speech perception so now coming to recording of cortical auditory evoke potentials how do we record cortical evoke potentials is similar to how we record auditory brainstem response and i'm sure all of you are familiar with this so the stimulus that we use can be a speech stimulus or it can be non speech stimulus it can be acoustic stimulus or it can be electrical stimulus and the recording is like already said in the beginning we can use a single channel instrument we can use a dual channel recording or we can use a multi channel recording ideal recording for cortical evoke potentials is definitely multi channel recording and multi channel recording gives us lot of information about neurophysiology so it helps us in understanding neurophysiology and it has the advantage of improving signal to noise ratio that is getting a clear waveforms artifact free waveforms is easier with a multi channel recording than with a single or a dual channel recording but definitely that is not a choice in routine clinical evaluation and we all know that every day clinic we most often majority of the clinicians are not using cortical evoke potentials so why is it that we don't use cortical evoke potentials in every day or we call it as under utilization of cortical auditory evoke potentials so one people feel that the instrument is expensive if you have to go for a multi channel equipment and then there is time constraints then clinicians feel that it is difficult to record because there are too many artifacts affecting the caps and we don't get a proper response the stimuli especially the speech stimuli is not available in not all clinical equipment though we now we have means of recording the speech stimuli and using it in many of the equipment and another interpreting is also people feel that it is difficult to interpret it's also sometimes it is just that we feel that oh it is not really important it is not really required or because the clinical application of caps are also little um, what is there a lot of gray areas in the clinical application what do we really call it as normal what do we call it as abnormal like for example in a central auditory processing disorder if you ask me for assessment my first choice of test would be behavioral test i would go for caps only if i have to use an objective measure to supplement that or if a child is not responding for behavioral measures only then i go for this so the clinical applications are also little uh, difficult to interpret so now coming to the recording of cortical auditory evoke potentials like i already said the stimuli i mean i just go to talk about the protocol for recording this and then we'll go into how do we really reduce artifacts by the so the stimuli used we can either use the acoustic stimuli or electric stimuli and today again i'm going to focus on acoustic stimuli in acoustic stimuli we can either use a speech or a non speech stimuli intensity of the stimulus we use will depend on what is the purpose since i said like most often we do not really use cortical auditory or potentials for threshold estimation we rarely use it for threshold estimation so we always Use it supra threshold level. So generally, the choice of intensity is around 65 to 70 dB SPF, and the duration of the stimulus, a good stimulus for cortical potentials, would be between 30 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. And the repetition rate is preferred repetition rate is 1.1 per second, or maximum we can go up to 3 per second, since we're using a lesser analysis window. and the transducer will depend on our purpose again so if we are doing um particular of potentials with a hearing device that is with a hearing aid or with a cochlear implant then we use loud speaker otherwise the choice would be ear phone or ear phone or insert ear phone again the preferred is insert ear phone so the acquisition parameters these are what are more important to get a artifact free cortical evoke potentials so the electrode voltage like i said can be single channel multi channel dual channel or multi channel so if you are having a minimum one channel recording then your electrode placement 
preferred electrode placement would be vortex and CZ for non-inverting. And inverting electrode would be on the mastoid. And this is again, the preferred is equilateral mastoid. But if you're testing with a hearing device, like a hearing gate or a cochlear implant, then I would put it on the contralateral mastoid. And for common electrode, the ground electrode, the preferred electrode placement is tip of the nose, but I always use low forehead for it. And if you're using dual channel or multi channel, then the number of non inverting electrodes we use will vary. It will, it will be increased. Inverting will remain the same. The non inverting would be, you can, depending on again, choice of your purpose of testing, you may use it in. C3, C4 or temporal lobes like the left temporal lobe and right temporal lobe or we can use it in vertex and parietal and frontal. So depending on the purpose, we choose this. Or if you're using really a 64 channel, 128 channel, then you don't really have to have the electrode cap which takes care of all of these things. So now we all know that these responses, we use a filter to filter the responses. And generally the filter is between 1 to 100 hertz, or some people prefer 1 to 30 hertz, or 0 0.1 to 30 hertz. And since cortical evoke potentials have quite a large amplitude compared to ABR or early potentials, we don't require too much of amplification over here. So 50,000 or even 30,000 will suffice for the amplification. The analysis window will depend on which potentials you're looking and what is the age of the per person you're testing. So normally if I'm talking of only obligatory cortical evoke potentials with my latency expected would be within 300 milliseconds. So even if there is a delay, it wouldn't go beyond 400. So the analysis window of 500 milliseconds or even 400 would be sufficient. What is important is that in the analysis window, please always have a pre-stimulus analysis window. That is, we should always see how the recording is when there is no stimulus and then compare it with how it is with stimulus. So the pre-stimulus analysis window of 50 to 100 milliseconds is what is generally good for. And since cortical evoke potentials are a bit larger amplitude compared to the earlier potentials, we don't really require too many averages or too many sweeps for averaging. So 150 sweeps to 300 sweeps are more than sufficient to record a reliable cortical evoke potentials. So what are the challenges we have while recording cortical evoke potentials? We all know that cortical evoke potentials are affected by sleep. It's not that it is totally absent when a person is sleeping. We have recorded cortical evoke potentials in children, sleeping children also, but the amplitude is reduced. So when the amplitude is reduced, what happens is if a response is present, I can go by it. If a response is absent, then it is difficult for me to say, is it the sleep which is affecting the response or is it that the child does not have a response? So the preferred ideal state would be, state would be the person should be awake, alert, but quiet. So this is the major challenge, especially when we're talking of children. Even in adult, awake and alert and not feeling drowsy becomes difficult. And here, for a child, it really becomes difficult that we have a child who is alert but quiet. So then the second problem we have is how do we improve signal-to-noise ratio? That is, how do we get a good cortical evoke potentials with minimal noise? So we all know that we have different techniques in the instruments to overcome this or improve the signal to noise ratio. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with this block diagram. So I'm not going into the details of this block diagram. So I'm only going to briefly recapitulate the different techniques that are present to improve signal to noise ratio. Because unless you understand this, we cannot control artifacts. So because the we can control artifacts only using these techniques. We cannot really do anything extra over here. So what is that the instrument do for uh, reducing artifacts? So first is the common mode rejection. And then we have filtering. 
and we have time lock averaging and then we have rejection. So common mode rejection basically eliminates electrical signals that are common at different electrode sites. So it measures electrical potentials from all the sites and then whatever is common will get cancelled off. If you have signals which are of different polarity, then it gets added up. So it can enhance certain electrical signals and it can always cancel certain electrical signals. Filtering again removes electrical signals which are out of the spectral content. So what is normally done is we need to decide which is the potentials we are measuring, what is the frequency content of the potentials, and based on that, we set the filter. So generally, we have a bandpass filter, so which I like already said, we use from 1 to 100 hertz or 1 to 30 hertz like that. So it will pass only those frequencies and cut off the other frequencies, both lower and higher frequencies. And the instruments also have an option for notch filter, that is, which can cut off electrical artifacts at 60 hertz or 50 hertz, depending on the power line. So next we have is time lock averaging. So when we are time lock averaging, what is done is only responses picked up during a certain duration of time or certain time frame of the presentation of the stimulus will be averaged. So this again is decided depending on which potentials we are measuring. So normally, for particularly work potentials, it is like up to 300 milliseconds. It is decided by the analysis window. So if I keep the analysis window to 300 milliseconds, then it will average for 300 milliseconds. And then whatever happens after 300 milliseconds, it will not be average. So that is another way of producing noise. Then the most important one we have is an artifact rejection. So artifact rejection thing, what basically what it does is it rejects electrical potentials which are very large in amplitude. So here we have to set a level that is uh, up to dash micro volts I want to record average. And if the response is beyond dash micro volts I want to reject it. So if you do that, then that would be the best way to actually cancel all the artifacts. But we have one problem. One is like, how do we really set this artifact level? So most often we say that for ABR, keep the artifact uh, rejection limit around 25 microvolts and for particle evoke potentials generally around 50 microvolts. But we all know that our particle evoke potentials really do not have amplitude of 50 microvolts. So they are still in the order of 2 3 microvolts. But the problem that happens is if I keep this very low, like I can keep it at 10 microvolts and try to record. So, but then what happens when I keep it at 10 microvolts is that it will keep rejecting a lot of sweeps. So when it keeps rejecting a lot of sweeps, the test duration will be very long. So we have to make it compromise between the two. So generally keep it as low as possible. So my recommendation is normally keep it at five, 50 microvolts or lesser than that. But I do know people who keep it at 100 microvolts also and record. So now to get an artifact free recording, what do we need to do? Um, like you all know, these are the general guidelines to get an artifact free recording, whether you're doing early responses or you're doing cortical potentials. So first is we have to have a good electrically shielded room. So the neutral voltage should be really very, very low. And we should have electrode sites clean properly so that we get a very low impedance. And what is more important is we get balanced impedance. That is the impedance that all electrode sites are similar. Because if I have electrode impedance of uh, 4 kilo ohms in one electrode site and 1 kilo ohm in the other, that will cause more problem than having 5 kilo ohms at both electrodes. Okay? Because the common mode rejection gets affected when there is an imbalance between electrode impedance of two electrodes. So then we generally say that if the electrode should be 
uh, bundle. I mean, it's like if you either uh, tie it up neatly and then put it to your hook. And the electrode box should be kept as close to the patient as possible, as away from the instrument as possible. And as far as possible, I avoid using other electrical items, especially if you feel that there is electrical interference. And most important, I always say, make sure that you choose the correct acquisition parameters to get it proper. So now what are the sources of artifacts we have? The sources of artifacts can be technical or it can be patient related or the participant related. So the technical meaning, it is an electrical thing. It's may, most often what happens is the power line interference. So there can be interference because of the power line. There can also be sometimes problem because we are electrode, electrodes are not good. The electrode impedance fluctuations happen. There. Maybe sometimes the electrodes are intermittent because of which there is fluctuation in impedance. Or in general, we have not cleaned properly, so there is high impedance. Okay. So, or the cable connectivity, there could be a problem, or shielding in the cable. So all these will be leading to technical artifacts. And these generally can be easily identified and eliminated. So the other source of artifacts we have where we have more difficulty in controlling is the participant or the patient related, I can also call it as physiological artifacts. So this becomes very difficult to control. So the physiological artifacts generally include muscle potential, ocular potential, skin potentials, or EK, heart related potentials, respiratory related potentials, or it could be related to the EEG potential, that is the alpha waves. So this shows some of the artifacts that are normally recorded while we are recording or to evoke potentials or any evoke potentials. That is, uh, you can see here, there can be potentials because of the ocular thing that is the saccades will be ocular. EMG is the muscle potentials and you have the skin potentials or the alpha waves so like that you have different potentials. And I just have a small video to show you how these potentials actually occur when we are doing it. What you can see here is when a person has closed the eyes, the, this is a, you can see the EEG over here down and top of the waveforms that are being recorded. So here actually we're trying to induce artifacts by making the patient do all this movement. So you can see after that command, after some time, it becomes straight because the person there's a reaction time by the person, and then you can see the EEG becoming better. So this is your muscle potential. So initially what was shown was the ocular potentials. Now what you're having is the muscle potential. So what I want you to highlight from this video is that if we really carefully look into the EEG, we most often look only into the waveform that we're recording. So instead of just looking into the waveform, 
look into the EEG background, EEG will tell you whether there are artifacts or no artifacts. And if you really are experienced and you're looking into the kind of EEG you're getting, you can say which artifact is predominantly effective in you know this thing. So even I went back to the previous one again. So if you look into this also, what I want to show is that the type of EEG you get will vary depending on what potentials it is recording. So if we carefully look into it, we can, to some extent, we can say what actually is contaminating our results. So now, Coming to the, this thing, how do we really reduce the artifacts? So normally what I say is to reduce the artifact. First, you need to identify where the artifacts are. And then the best method is try to eliminate the artifacts. If you're not able to eliminate the artifacts, then go in for other means of doing it. I had a slide on it. I was trying to look for it. So now I've just outlined some of the uh, artifacts and how do we really, what can be done to reduce these artifacts. So to how do we reduce the power line interference? I think all of you are familiar with this power line interference, which is more like a sinusoidal wave. So generally the common mode rejection takes care of this power line interference. As long as we have low impedance and we have balanced impedance. Okay, so make sure you check the impedance and make sure that the impedance is balanced and check for breaking cable or shielding if power line is generally interfering. And if electrode like impedance is good, there is no breaking cable, nothing, then still you have power line interference, then the option is use notch filter. So why we say don't, I mean, there are some people may say, why don't you put the notch filter on all the time? Uh, because again, it depends on what is the potential you're recording. When I'm recording cortical evoke potentials, 50 hertz also gives me some information, meaning the cortical evoke potentials also have some energy at 50 hertz. So when I use a notch filter of 50 hertz, it can actually reduce some of the actual signal. That is, it can reduce the cortical potentials. It will also reduce the electrical light. So don't use it as a first option. If you're not able to eliminate electrical artifacts, then use this. So if you have to reduce the EEG artifacts, then what do we do? That again, generally it is said that the common mode rejection eliminates the EEG artifacts because whatever is common at all the electrode sites get eliminated. So again, the key thing here is ensuring balanced impedance. Okay. And Another thing that normally helps in reducing EEG artifact is using link mastoid as reference. That is, normally we record from, say, CZM1 or CZM2, like that. So instead of doing that, since anyway we are not interested in the response from mastoid, left mastoid versus right mastoid, what I normally do for cortical potential is use a jumper between the two mastoids. So I'm linking the two mastoids so the end that is used as a reference and that normally reduces more of power line artifacts. And it's also said that the EEG artifacts actually increases when a person is drowsy or he's bored. And if you people have experienced cortical evo, I mean, recorded cortical evo potential, you would have experienced that a lot of times we feel in the beginning we get a nice waveform. And as the number of averages increases, the amplitude reduces. So initially we used to feel, okay, why is it happening this way? So it is probably because when a person, in the beginning, the person is awake and is alert. And then as I continue to do it, the person, even if he's not sleeping, he may get bored. So that time also the alpha band noise increases. So when the alpha band noise increases, obviously our signal to noise ratio deteriorates. So the, uh, what do we do to eliminate that is one, make sure that the person is awake and alert. So maybe in between just talk to him or show him or give him something to read, 
they, you can, he can be watching the video, he can be, I mean, I'll come to that when he watches a video, there are other potentials that can happen. Something like that can be done. And like in case of children, we normally have some activity or show some picture books, something like that to make sure that the child is awake and alert. And another option I also have is use shorter block of averages. That means if I want to record particular of potentials for 300 sweeps, I don't have to do 300 sweeps at one go. I can record for 100 sweeps, stop the testing. So we can have a short break for the person, talk to him for two minutes, and then again have a second one. So this actually helps in getting replicability. And then we can always do offline averaging or offline adding. So that will help me in getting a particular of potentials for 300 sweeps or 200 sweeps, whatever is my goal. And then the other option you also have is use offline digital filtering. Most of the instruments do have facility for offline filtering. So that is offline is a digital filtering that is happens and you can choose the brand and for particularly oak potentials normally we choose between 1 to 30 hertz or 0 0.1 to 30 hertz. So this is just put a waveform to show uh, a effect of uh, offline filtering. So what you see in the screen is unfiltered responses. That is responses picked up with 1 to 100 hertz. And what you see here is after offline filtering. So what you can see is that I'm just putting the back of unfiltered again. There are a lot of peaks in the unfiltered one, multiple these things, which gets smoothened when you do filtering. And Okay, this is suppose the uh, heading is wrong over here. It should be filtered responses. My cut and paste. I forgot to change it to filter. Okay. So this filtering actually cuts the EEG thing, but it also can smoothen the EO potentials too much. Sometimes we miss the peaks when you filter it also. So we need to be really careful when you do this filtering. It will not, it's not always a good choice. So you can again see here in this, in one, this was actually from two channels, what you're seeing here, two waveforms. In one channel, you have a smooth waveform, and in the other channel, you have too many artifacts. So this again looks like a background EEG, which is affecting it. And if you smoothen it, you'll probably get a waveform like this, where both the sides you have good waveform. So that is about the EEG artifacts now coming to the muzzle artifacts how do we uh, uh, eliminate that so like i said the best thing is always reduce the movement so now reducing the movement it is easy for us to tell an adult okay sit quietly or lie down quietly and don't move whereas if you're doing it in children it becomes difficult so generally we use some activity to engage these children or to make sure that the child is active. I mean, alert, but quiet. So what we really do in this, we need to be very careful when choosing these activities. So generally the best choice, what we have found is like putting a mehendi on, most children enjoy this thing. So we put mehendi on child's hand and the child is engrossed in looking into it. So there is no movement in this thing. Otherwise the other things we have is showing picture books where the child may suddenly become more active over there and can, that can lead to muscle artifacts. Again, we can also try offline filtering to see if it can help. So, the major, major problem we have when we're doing this particular of potentials is ocular artifacts. So we all know that there is what is called as corneoretinal potentials and this corneoretinal potentials can affect the particle or the geo potential. And this again affects particle of potentials more than our early responses because early APR the patient is sleeping, so we don't really have these potentials affecting them. So the person is awake, alert, and sometimes to keep them awake, what we do is we let them see a video or let them see read and read something. So during all that time there will be movement of eyeballs. And even if you don't give them anything to read or watch, a person cannot just sit 
quiet and keep the eyes open all the time. So if he keeps the eyes closed, then he'll be drowsy. So you'll want him to keep the eyes open. And keeps the eyes open, there is always eye blink. So either the eye blink or the lateral movement of eyes will always lead to heart attacks. And how do we really reduce these artifacts? That is the biggest problem we have when we're recording cortical low potentials. Again, the best method to reduce these macular art artifacts are generally very large. The amplitude of these artifacts are quite large. So the best way is use an artifact rejection. That is, if you're using optimum artifact rejection, we may be able to eliminate these ocular artifacts. But if you're not able to eliminate the ocular artifacts, then what do we do? So then we need to correct for these ocular artifacts. So how do we correct for these ocular artifacts? Uh, the best way of correcting in this thing is actually doing an independent component analysis. It's but you require a multi-channel instrument for this. And to do this independent component analysis, you have to record potentials from different channels. And there is a something like a principal component analysis the instrument does. And you get a noise-free recording. But if I'm using a two-channel equipment, then I won't be able to do that. So the other choice I have in that is record the ocular potentials and subtract it from the recorded cortical layer positions. So if we have a single channel instrument, we can't do it. If you do not, if you have at least a two channel instrument, we will be able to do it. So now to record this ocular potentials, what do we do? We need to dedicate one channel. Instead of doing two channel cortical layer potentials, I'll be recording cortical layer potentials from one channel. And in the other channel, I will be recording the ocular potentials. So now how do I record the circular potentials will again depend on which potentials I'm looking into. That is, is it the eye blink or is the lateral movement? Ideally, I should be doing both. So if I have to record both, then I will again require one more channel and I'll require three channels. So if I have only two channels, then I'm most often, my choice would be saying I want eye blink because the lateral movements do not cause as much artifact as the eye blink. So for recording ocular artifacts, it's like how we do in the web, ocular this thing. So we need to place electrodes. If you want to record in the vertical plane, you place one below the eyes and one above the eyebrows. The electrodes. And if you want to record horizontal plane, that is the lateral movements you want to record, and then you have to place on the inner and outer side of the eyes. So now once we record these like we have one channel would be recording our ocular potentials and the other channel would be recording our cortical level potentials. Then what we do is we have to do an offline analysis where we subtract this corneoretinal potentials from cortical potentials. And frankly, in my routine clinical evaluation, I have not been really doing this I, because somehow we are able to get a in fact, the cortical level potential even without this. But for the sake of trying out, we've tried it out in our clinics. And somehow when I've tried this, actually, I mean, I can't really put it as a study or anything. It is just on a two, three pair normal subjects we've tried it. And you can see here, the first waveform is actually the cortical level potentials we have recorded. And the second waveform on the screen that, that is, is the uh, subtracted waveform. Okay, and down what we have is all the ocular this thing recorded. So the subtracted waveforms actually have lesser amplitude than this amplitude. And these are from two different subjects, and both the subjects we found similar results. Actually, there is also a study which shows that uh, which shows that if, if you use artifact limiting, it gives better amplitude than correcting these artifacts. In a, in a normal two-channel instrument I'm talking of, I'm not talking of a multi-channel equipment. So, to finally, to summarize or to conclude, what I would say is that reliable cortical OTG potentials can be recorded using clinically available OTG potential systems. And 
the main key for artifact free particle oddity of potential is to identify the source of artifacts and then try to either eliminate it or you try to correct these artifacts. I have some of the waveforms which we have recorded in our clinic. Like this is particle oddity of potentials recorded from a normal child, around seven year old child. And this is particularly work potentials recorded from a child using offline implant. So I have used, most often I use an offline filtering for my particle work potentials. So we have used offline filtering here, but you can see a smooth, uh, good peak over here in this case. And this is recently we did particularly work potentials in P300 from a person with origin neuropathy spectrum disorder. And this person had very poor word recognition score and somebody referred the person to us for particularly work potentials and did it for a clinical testing. So what you can see is that we've marked the peaks, but the amplitude are very low and the replicability is very poor. And I always have this theory saying when the particularly work potential morphology is poor and the amplitude is less, the word recognition is generally less and the benefit they get from hearing aids is also going to be limited. We don't always get good waveforms like this. Sometimes do end up with waveforms like this. Now, for sure, this particular level of potential waveforms now, like you can all see that there are too many artifacts over there induced by CI. You know, do I call it as a no response or do I call it as a noisy response? And it really becomes difficult to interpret. Incidentally, this child is also not doing well. And the outcome is really not good. But I cannot really say it is absent or particularly of potentials are not clear unless I get an artifact free response in this child in this. So that is in brief about reducing artifacts or what can we do to get a good particularly potentials. I would like to thank Isha for organizing this webinar and giving me an opportunity to share my experience here. And I would, thank you. I would like to thank our institute, Bharti Vidya Preeti University, for permitting me to participate in this webinar. And the radiologist Rucha Vivek helped me in getting all this uh, artifacts and other part of it, which with the video I showed. So I thank her for helping me in doing this presentation. And of course, I always have the support and encouragement from my friends in the audiology speech language pathology community and my students at Aish and Bhakti Vidya Pit who actually have taught me of whatever I have learned so far. So with this, I conclude this presentation and I'm open for questions or discussions. Thank you, Vanaja. That was a brilliant talk, giving us an uh, overview to cortical potentials, then going into details about all the um, ways in which you can cut down artifacts. And you've shown us uh, actual waveforms, giving us an idea about how they can uh, be reduced and uh, how we may be able to interpret it. So I see that there are Ajay, are you also online? I think we've lost Ajay. Um, I'm online, ma'am. Okay, you are on. Chandan has his hand up, so yes. we want to start with Chandan, or uh, I have questions also. If Chandan has his start question, you can. Ch we'll start with Chandan. Start with Chandan, it will not end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask about why do you have to hold the preamplifier near to the head? Keep it close to head. That is because it will you'll be picking up lesser of the other artifacts. That's it. Okay, so we have to keep it away from other sources. Other, so basically, it is to be keeping away from the other sources and closer to the source we want. I mean, if you really have a good electrical shielding and all, it really shouldn't matter. 
I'm talking of this more when you think that there is a power line interference, you go in for this. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry, Vanisha, can you put a slide in? Because we have a blank slide here. This is being recorded. Okay. I did something wrong. Okay. And continue, Chandan. No, he said thank you. Oh, he said thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else has a question? Or I, I'll ha I have a question, Vanisha. Um, how do you yeah. differentiate an ocular potential from a muscular potential? Because I think when you're trying to add, uh, take out those artifacts, you, you would check out to say it, which one of it it is, and then uh, yeah. try to eliminate it, I presume. Yeah. Well, one way of doing it is watch the child or the person to see which movement is there. Okay. Oh, okay. That is whether a person is moving or it is the eyes this thing. Otherwise, if you carefully observe this, see when I see these different types of artifacts, the way you get this, yeah, what it says EMG, that is a muscle artifact. Okay. And where it is showing the saccades, that is the ocular artifact. So the artifacts do look different, but you one needs to be a little experienced in observing this EMG. And how do you eliminate each one of them? You tell specific things you would tell them to not move or, or not blink, is it? That is what I said. That is the best way of doing it. Okay. When you cannot do that, we have to use either artifact rejection or we have to use the filtering part of it. Uh, when you do acoustical uh, cortical potentials versus uh, electrical cortical potentials, what is the big difference that you have to do with reference to artifacts? Uh, in fact, when you do an electrical um, cortical of potentials, the artifacts will be lesser. Because one, we are bypassing the speech processor over there. But you have and a big is. stimulus artifact, so that's a big issue, right? The stimulus artifact. Um, I actually have not really done much of electrical cortical of potentials. When I've done electrical ABR, I don't really have not seen problem with the stimulus artifact. Okay. okay. Achaya, any questions from the participants? Ma'am, uh, Dr. Madhuri Gore has her hand raised, ma'am. I'll just uh, okay. unmute okay. ma'am's mic. Sure. Uh, yeah. Hi, Vanija. That was a great presentation. And uh, this slide also is the right thing. I, I had a question on this alpha waves. These alpha waves, how, uh, what is the amplitude of these alpha waves? Amplitude of these alpha waves, sir. Not much. You know, the muscle artifacts and the ocular artifacts really have very high amplitude. Hmm. Whereas the alpha waves are not really high in amplitude. In this thing. So actually, even the artifact rejection, whatever we use, will not really help us in reducing this alpha wave amplitude. Okay. So they are in the order of like, they're generally like lesser than 25 micro -os in this thing. Okay. So it is like an auditory of potential with very low small amplitude. Oh, okay. Uh, we had um, like uh, sawtooth waves. We had <laughs> artifacts like sawtooth <laughs> waves. So have you experienced those? No, sawtooth waves you had. Was it a saccadic movement of the eyes you had or? Now your heads also look a bit like that, but those are very, very regular. <laughs> but this is, you know, maybe sometimes in the small screen it looks um, like uh -huh. they look large and only two or three. Uh, and when you think of a VOR, no, the VOR is like a uh, how you get a sort of thing. So if the VOR is the, the ocular reflexes, the ocular potentials are affecting, then you get this. 
and then when you subtract offline if you do a two channel that was brilliant this if you subtract mm -hmm. it offline that is acceptable mm -hmm. right as a report yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's acceptable okay. there is an article also regarding it i can mail you that article yeah thank you Dr. Chandan has a question. I have put the questions in written as uh, how much of post stimulus blocking do you use for electrical stimuli? How much of? Uh, post stimulus uh -huh. blocking. Actually, like I said, Chandan, I'm not really done electrical testing. So my experience is all more with acoustical in everything. Acoustical cortical work potentials. We only CI have done acoustical. Okay. Not electrical. Jay, um, uh, I think there is uh, Narendra has a come comment he wants to add on to something that uh, chandan has said maybe you can switch on his mic yes ma'am yes Narendra, are you there? But theoretically, I can say, Chandan, you can block like 30 milliseconds because we look into cortical yoke potentials only from 50 milliseconds. Okay. I mean, that is my theoretical, I'm saying. I'm not sure you don't have any experience in this. Do you recommend doing offline filtering or uh, think it's not a good idea because you gave this explanation saying you might be taking off some part of the signal and the amplitude comes down. So in your experience, uh, good or not good? Ideally not good, but if I'm not able to eliminate artifacts with other means, I do it. Okay. But even with the offline filtering, I do get a good response. This is with reference to a lot of times I do offline filtering. Mm -hmm. Acular artifact subtraction, I don't do it, but offline filtering, I do it a lot of times. Why don't you sir, do off, uh, ocular uh, artifact subtraction? Uh, basically, like I said, I have not really had so much of problem in eliminating it because of which I don't do. And a couple of times when I've tried, I feel that amplitude reduces. But anyway, yes, it does give a, the, this thing as to sh show that even though we've reduced the ancillary artifacts, the response still exists. Like the waveforms I showed you, if you remember, the amplitude was reduced. But okay. it is telling you that the response is still present. So I can that way I can be confident saying yes, it is a response. But to look into a larger system, the upper one is better. What happened to uh, Narendra? Is he there, uh, Chandan? I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I, just, I, just, I just read out the comment, ma'am. I unmuted sure. the mic. Uh, uh, one of the ma'am, uh, regarding yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Chandra's first question, ma'am, there's a comment which says, ma'am, preamplifier close yeah. to head also reduces the length of the electrode cables, which can potentially act as antenna receiving other electrical artifacts. Huh. Yeah, that is what it is. Other. Correct. Yes, ma'am. And there's a question from Deepa, ma'am. Unmute her mic. Deepa, if you're listening, um, it says that your 
uh, mic is self muted you have to unmute the mic yourself and ask the question hello hello ha we can hear you okay ma'am i wanted to ask when we are using correction for the ocular potentials in the second channel uh, do we need to uh, is it possible then to use different acquisition parameters because i am guessing that the ocular potential may need a different filter setup and uh, acquisition related parameters than the caps or uh, how is it you can change the thing and do it but otherwise you can do with us i mean if you are Again, it depends on the instrument. If the instrument doesn't have the facility to vary it, you can do it with the same. But it is preferable that you change it independently. Oh. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Doctor Chandran has one more question, ma'am. The question goes like this: Would the waveforms look different for different speech stimuli? Yes, it does look. Uh, look different meaning um uh, i don't have the same concept but it you do get uh, um, the latencies and the amplitude do vary slightly so you have a different waveform can i move out of this slide and then look into my laptop to get a waveform for chandan You can be asking other questions till then. Meanwhile, I can search for the. Yes, yeah, no questions. Um, Ajay, you can ask him. Ma'am, ma'am, there is only one comment by Manjula, ma'am, ma'am. Do you know the question, ma'am? The comment goes like this, ma'am. No, no, I'm not. He's got no. His post and pre-stimulus blocked for stimulus uh, electricals. Okay, he asked that already. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Doctor, someone ma asked that. Ma'am, Doctor Manjula, ma'am has uh, commented informative and lucent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ma Manjula, for your comment. Thank you. <laughs> and while Vanaja is trying to get that, I'd just like to tell you all that Maisha is holding another webinar tomorrow. It's about certification, and I think uh, a few people have received um, emails uh, about it. It is being organized by the, the Maisha chapter. and uh, if anybody is interested you can write in to uh, dr goswami's email and he will send you the link for it it's free and it's going to start at 6 o'clock in the evening i'm sorry i can Actually, I saw a waveform. I went to put it in the presentation. They didn't put it, but I can't get it now. The waveforms look slightly different, but your overall morphology is similar, children. I can send the waveforms to you sometime. Uh, Vanaja, if you were, had to tell uh, the participants about selecting an instrument or a company's product which has lesser artifacts, do you think you would suggest one over another, or you think all of them do similar kind of uh, uh, get similar kind of responses, and the artifacts don't vary across the instruments? I would say these artifacts mainly are uh, more the physiological artifacts which are affecting our cortical evoke potentials. So one instrument or another instrument, yes, there is a difference in terms of the filter or the amplifier that is used by the instruments. Which mm -hmm. actually, that is, I'm not talking of the filter settings we use before the A to D conversion and before that they have a filter. So those filters actually vary, and depending on that, the morphology varies. But uh, I don't really have anything like I have. Well, from the time I was in Aish to now, I've used Nicolet, I've used Biologic, I've used IHS. I feel if we choose an appropriate protocol, we do get and I've used interacoustics. So 
so we do get similar waveforms or we do get good waveforms in all the instruments mm. i don't really have experience with other equipment but these four are always see that you get good and uh, do you think uh, somebody who's sweaty versus not sweaty you're saying is physiological yes yes, yes. thank you uh, actually they does <laughs> make a difference i <laughs> because actually this it said that when there is lot of sweat the skin potentials increase okay so skin potentials can also interfere with the results so sweaty versus non sweaty can also be interference in the result so you you would suggest then that the person shouldn't be sweaty so you put them in an ac room and do uh, the test yeah. yes okay yes keep them cool Cool. Okay, so people in the coastal region are probably likely to have more problems then, if they don't have an AC room. Mm. Again, it depends. If the person is already adjusted to that and is not really sweating that much, maybe. Okay, but it it it, it, can, it. it can induce skin. It, I mean, sweat can induce skin potentials. Okay. Ajay, there I see question marks with again some some names. Priya has got a question mark. You want to ask her? She has a question, or uh, it says unanswered. Ma'am, uh, uh, she has typed the question, ma'am. Okay, can, can you ask? Read it okay. out. Okay, go ahead. Ma'am, given the settings, what would be the preferred stimulus to be used? what would be the preferred stimulus to be used for in general yes in general does she have any yes. no ma'am in general that's all the uh, question is generally the preferred stimulus is speech but if you do not have facility like when i came to bharti initially i didn't have an instrument which would give speech stimulus so i used to do with nicolet tone burst and with hearing aids also we used to use tone burst and topical evoc potentials even if we would get information that is required for that as but given a choice use speech stimulus and generally i find task stimulus a good stimulus for recording i mean good way for the okay with task Acha, you will continue asking questions. There's only questions here. Ma'am, uh, uh, but most of them, ma'am, uh, Dr. Chandan's questions, uh, sir, has uh, written at the end saying that uh, they have been answered. Uh, there's okay. one more question, which is this. Uh, it just says, uh, it says, ma'am, what should be taken care in case of tele ABR? in case of tele apr i mean it the you see basically tele apr what you're doing is your control is i mean uh, the patient is in one setup and the tester is in a different setup which we are connecting through internet or any of the tele mode this thing so there isn't anything extra for the physiological artifacts to be controlled over there it is basically the electrical thing which may interfere which needs to be Okay. But the physiological artifacts will remain the same whether you're doing a tele APR or you're doing a face-to-face -face evoke potentials. Um, uh, there is also a couple of comments, ma'am, added to the question which was uh, asked by Dr. Chandan regarding uh, different speech stimuli, ma'am. The comment goes like this, ma'am. Mr. Narendra has commented saying that in my experience is that high frequency stimuli gives better latency and good morphology. For example, ga, ta, rather than ma or ga. Yeah, ta gives the best response. Comment by one of yeah. the Incidentally, even with ma, I've got good responses. Question, ma'am. In hyperactive kids, how do we manage to do CAEP? Sedate them? Sedation is definitely not the choice. 
because if you sedate, you're putting the child to sleep and not to deep sleep, which will definitely affect the evoke potential. I mean, that is the last choice I would do. Um, hyperactive, yes, it is really difficult. So we have to most often involve the therapist because the therapist knows how to control the behavior. So I generally, if I'm doing cortical evoke potential and I see a child, I call the therapist also so that they keep them busy and then we do what part of recording potentials. And like I already said, like I don't say that you cannot record at all when a child is sleeping. So the last choice would be doing it when a child is sleeping. If you get a response, yes, you can definitely say that uh, it's functioning. If you don't get a response, you'll have to do it again when the child is out. Okay, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this um, A N cases, no, have you found any difference? in the stimulus you use, whether you use ma or ta or uh, ga or... Yeah. I always get the best response with ta. Ta, no? Mm. Yeah. yeah, even I thought because for, uh, or if you are using a, a tone burst, better to use a higher frequency, click or a high frequency, right? Yeah. Click is not really a choice for uh, Cortical evoke potential yeah, because, because we, we do require longer duration signal. Click is too short. So, I mean, we do get a response with click, but that is not really the choice of stimuli. Uh -huh. Go but for tone burst. Tone burst. But then uh, low frequency tone burst will be. Uh, you may not get for AN, so it is best to have a uh, big stimulus. On it. Achay, will you ask the other questions? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Indrin has a question, ma'am. Uh, can chirp stimulus be used? Artifact controlled during the capture, any role? This is the question, ma'am. You can get cortical evoke potential using any stimuli, so you can use chirp stimuli also. But again, like, um, uh, what that second part of the question I didn't understand. Okay, uh, I think he wants to know how you control artifacts for that while you're can, trying to use chirp. I think that's what his question is. Indra, can you uh, maybe so, unmute? That's why I said, why do you think chirp will lead to more, I mean, different kind of artifacts? I don't know. Do you want to unmute it so that Indra Neil can ask the question himself? Ajaya? Ajaya is not, uh, not being displayed. Now maybe sir is on the floor. Okay, he's in some other thing. No problem. Chandan had a comment to this, uh, your, the question about hyperactive children. How do you manage them? Do you sedate? Okay. This is his own yeah. question. He's asking also, do you want to be given uh, and letting them have natural sleep, do the testing during natural sleep? Yeah, between sedation and natural sleep, I would prefer natural sleep. But the responses won't be good still, right? Yeah, yeah the responses still will not be good. Okay. And there's one more question, ma'am. The question goes like this. Often I have encountered a huge spike around 30 to 35 millisecond or even earlier, which is followed by the P1, N1, P2 while recording for children using cochlear implant. The instrument being used is here lab ACA. What could be the possible source of this and how could this be elevated? That is this cochlear implant. This thing artifact does happen over the 35 to 40. I think Madhuri also would have experienced this around 35 milliseconds. We do see a big peak in that. One option is you block the thing. You, initial 
uh, averaging can be blocked for stimulus. So block for 40 milliseconds and you get only. But the hair lab, I don't know whether it has the options for doing all this. Because again, the hair lab instrument is very, very dedicated instrument. It's I don't think it has this kind of option, but I'm not very really sure. If there is anybody who has used your lab, maybe they can answer this. Um, there's a comment, ma'am. Um, I think to this question itself that was asked earlier, in CI, it's the RF artifact. Nothing much can be done. Ah, okay, good for bringing up this point. When you're doing electrical uh, cortical evoke potentials or auditory brainstem response, there is RF artifact and the instruments do have RF filter for that. For example, when I use biologic, I do have an RF filter with it, which can be used to reduce these artifacts. I've used it with ABR, so I'm sure it should also help with cortical evoke potentials. The next question is, ma'am, does the type of processor really influence the potentials of the year and at year level? I think there are a lot of questions of the cochlear implant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, type of, I mean, there are studies which show that depending on the type of processor, the artifacts you get are different. With reference to what was the further part of it, he said, of the year or the? Of the year or on the versus that uh, on so versus that kind of thing. That's yeah. what it That I don't think should make a difference because in any case, if I'm doing with CIA, I always recommend doing it in the contralateral master. Well. So if you're doing binaural, is where we have <laughs> if you want to test with both of and on, then it's going to be a little tricky. Otherwise, we normally choose the contralateral mass or so artifacts are lesser. Um, um, example, Canso versus N6 is the I think the one Canso is that of the year and N6 yeah, yeah, is yeah, a, so, uh, N6. And on, on the year, the uh, I think I answer that question. Yeah. Uh, there's a follow-up comment, ma'am. Uh, it says no of the year or BT processes. It is mainly to do with the transmitter coil. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. Whether it is of the year or this thing, it really doesn't make it. Those were the questions for now, ma'am. I'm sorry, what did you say, Chair? Those are the questions for now. For now. Anybody what else has a question? Priya had a question. Did you? It's still not answered, and it's showing. Uh, marks will uh, always stay like that ma'am unless i type something and send it to them so okay. it will show as a question mark itself ma i'll just check ma'am no, there is a question saying in clinic settings what would be the preferred stimulus to be used that was priya's uh, yeah, So I, I think we are done with the questions. So uh, if there are no more moment. questions, are there more Number questions? One, one okay. moment. Okay. How reliable are these potentials in differential diagnosis in ANSD? Sometimes we enco encounter absence of potentials in ANSD. Uh, the theory I believe in ANSD and cortical evoke potential is that Basically, it helps us in knowing the severity of the synchrony. Because we all know that uh, ANSD, what is lost is a synchronous firing or 
and for APR, we require highly synchronous firing. Cortical evoked potential requires less synchronous firing. So, what I believe is that if both cortical evoked potentials and ABR are absent, the severity is much more than a person where ABR is absent but cortical evoked potential is present. That's so how I say when cortical evoked potential is also absent, the word recognition score or the speech understanding is much poorer in ANAC compared to presence of cortical evoked potentials. Of course, there are some people who don't believe in this one, but I don't know, somehow whenever I see a patient, it is does correlate with it. That's all, ma'am. The questions. Thank you so much, Vanaja. That was a brilliant talk, and I think all of us really enjoyed listening to you. And I once again thank all the participants for being so very attentive and wanting to learn at this part of the evening. Um, it shows your dedication and wanting to learn more. And we really hope that we get this RCI points and you benefit from not just uh, learning the information, but also get your CRE points. Uh, it looks very positive. So I hope we will be able to give you good news the next time we conduct it. And the next set of webinars will be conducted by Dr. Bonick um, with Himanshu. Himanshu was supposed to re register. I don't see his name in the registration list over here. But So thank you very much, all of you. And have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Acharya. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Asha, and thank you, Acharya. Good night, everybody. Welcome, ma'am. No problem, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.